everyone. Before we begin, can I have a show of hands from the audience? Who here owns Bitcoin? Show of hands. That's a lot. That's about 30%. Who owns Ethereum, Ether? Slightly less, about 20%. And who has owned DigiCash? <laughs> one hand. I see one hand here. Excellent. <laughs> To tell us more about DigiCash and how it fits into today's cryptocurrency landscape, we have the man who invented it, David. Well, thanks, June. Uh, yeah, back in, in 92, we, we launched eCash, which was the first digital bearer instrument, a number that was worth money. And the, uh, this was at the World Wide Web conference, the first one, which was at Geneva, where the web was born, two keynote speakers, myself, and then Tim Berners-Lee, and I s sent the first eCash payment internationally from Geneva to Amsterdam at that time. Now, this was a, a, a slightly different from Bitcoin and Ethereum in that when you make a payment, no one can tell who made the payment. This is protected even against infinite computing power, but the person making the payment gets an irrefutable proof of who the recipient was. And this was what made it resistant against criminal use of payments, extortion, black markets, and bribery, as defined by the Bank for International Settlement uh, at that time. And so later, uh, eCash was, that was our Cyberbucks currency, our own currency. And we had about 100 merchants, but later a Deutsche Bank issued eCash in Deutsche Marks, and we had an Australian uh, major bank issuer, U.S. bank issuer, other European countries, and Amura licensed it, and so on. So it was uh, distributed in a different way uh, than Bitcoin. We had many independent issuers. I see. Uh, Chris, can you explain how Bitcoin picks up the story from where DigiCash left off? Bitcoin, uh, the Bitcoin white paper is released by Satoshi Nakamoto in October 2008. Uh, the network goes live in January of 2009, right amidst the financial crisis. And Bitcoin since uh, has grown enormously. So today we have hundreds of thousands of computers distributed around the world uh, that are monitoring, clearing, and settling uh, Bitcoin transactions. So we can think of it as if I were to pass Joe a $20 bill or $20 worth of Bitcoin, because Bitcoin can be divided into smaller units than one Bitcoin, everyone here sees that transaction. And everyone can validate that that transaction took place and update their memory with that, with, with, with that transaction. That is basically what's happening with Bitcoin on a global basis. Uh, Bitcoin is transacting over a billion dollars a day right now. So that's uh, over half a million dollars a minute. Um, and you know, if we were to look at the size or the scale of computers supporting Bitcoin, if Google, uh, Google were to take all of its compute power and throw it at Bitcoin, uh, it would amass less than one quarter of 1% of the entire Bitcoin network. Oh, we should have had a conversation about AWS as well. <laughs> um, but then, um, Joe, so where does Ethereum come into the picture? Sure. So uh, David invented uh, uh, applying blinded signatures, applying cryptography to the application of money. Um, he invented centralized cryptocurrency or cryptocurrency on a server. Um, Satoshi invented three things, uh, decentralized cryptocurrency, uh, cryptocurrency of the people, by the people, for the people on many different in-sync computers. Um, that application, the money application, was on the second invention, the blockchain, which is a trust machine. And so when you have lots of machines in sync and they're independently controlled, it's a much more difficult system to improperly manipulate. The third element is crypto economics that uh, enables people to be incentivized to, to run this system. Uh, all of that essentially creates the trust machine, a decentralized compute infrastructure. Uh, Vitalik Buterin, the inventor of Ethereum, uh, and many others at the time, uh, 2012 roughly, uh, started to feel like uh, this infrastructure for building uh, trusted applications should be applied to much more than just the single use case, the single application of money. And so we set out to uh, separate the protocol layer cleanly from the application layer and make uh, it 
possible and relatively easy for average software developers to build any sort of application they want uh, on this blockchain-based system. So uh, we set out to build one of the uh, first and perhaps central components of the coming decentralized World Wide Web. And, and smart contracts are, are essentially are, programs that execute those on are the, the Ethereum programs that blockchain. sit uh, on top of Ethereum. Um, and essentially, we defined the token Ether not so much as a money, although it's a better money than Bitcoin because it's much more programmable, but we defined it as a crypto commodity uh, because you need, little, you need to pay little bits of it uh, to run programs and to store data on this world sure. computer. Sure. So, you know, obviously the hot topic these days is the price of these uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, so two quick questions for the panel. Is it a bubble, whether it's Bitcoin or, or Ethereum? And what is the one metric you look at to uh, make that judgment call, to evaluate the health of that particular cryptocurrency? To declare anything a bubble, we need a relative basis evaluation, or we need a reflection on what the past has been, when things have been overvalued or undervalued, and what is the present. Right now, within the crypto industry, we're just at the earliest stages of defining those valuation techniques. Um, you know, I like to differentiate between local maximums and global maximums. And we have seen the crypto asset markets go through undulations over time. But if you look at late 2013, for example, uh, which prior to this year, everyone declared that was the big bubble, um, you know, the aggregate network value of the markets peaked at around $16 billion. You know, we're currently approaching $200 billion. And so when you look at what people used to call the big bubble, um, compared to what's going on now, it looks kind of cute. You, you almost can't see it. And that is, uh, and when you follow this progression, each prior bubble, uh, you know, is, is basically indistinguishable. And so what I would say, um, going forward is that we will continue to have these iterations. And when we look at the tech and telecom boom, you know, that peaked at 2.9 trillion, I think it was at the time, the Bloomberg Tech Index. This you, is the, ninth, uh, the 2000. In, in 2000. You adjust that for inflation, that was uh, roughly 4 trillion. So, you know, we're not even 5% of the way to what that was. And I think we can very easily make the argument that this, uh, this movement could be more powerful than that movement based on a innovation around the technology and the financial instrument that's used. Uh, what, what metric, though? Metric, I think a good, a good simple valuation metric would be the NVT ratio, so network value, which is the value stored by a crypto asset, divided by its daily transaction volume. And so if you look at Bitcoin, that's been roughly in the 80 range, or it averages that. And the reason this is a good ratio is it's similar to uh, price-to-earnings ratio with, with equities or stocks, because with equities, those are priced uh, by the markets in terms of the earnings. And if you think of a blockchain, as, as Joe was saying, a blockchain transacts value. That is the utility to a crypto asset, just as earnings is the utility to a company. And so the market pricing as a multiple of that utility is a good way to see, OK, where are we uh, in comparison to historical norms? Gotcha. Yeah, as Chris indicated, we've had many bubbles already in the cryptocurrency or blockchain space, each much larger than the other. Um, this is, these are good bubbles. Uh, these are bubbles that drive innovation. Uh, when um, essentially we're moving from a world in which we're building siloed information systems on legacy style databases, the Web 2.0 world, to a world in which we have this new shared, non-redundant, trustworthy infrastructure, the trust machine. And so we can start building um, IT infrastructure that has collaboration as a foundational component. We can have uh, information systems for sectors, for industries, for value chains, and that's going to drive a tremendous amount of growth. So I think the speculation is warranted. Metric? Um, Chris is the crypto econo economist. Uh, my favorite metric in the space um, is developers, developers, developers. Uh, essentially, if you're building out an ecosystem, uh, that's the only thing that matters. 
Do you, how do you quantify that? GitHub so, commits? Or? Yeah, uh, we, we had a, uh, a friend uh, who works at Gartner um, indicate that he was looking at a variety of different metrics like, like GitHub, et cetera, and that uh, uh, you know, Bitcoin is incredibly popular amongst people that like the money application. Um, in the decentralized World Wide Web type of context, uh, he considered Ethereum to be 30 times larger in terms of uh, the developer community than probably um, the second most popular one, which is IBM's Fabric. David, do you have a view on the cryptocurrency markets today? Well, I, I could say that, I mean, it's all the rage and everyone I, I talk to, random people I meet on a, a street, you know, are uh, very excited about it. So, I mean, to me, that's a, that's a fundamental indicator. Gotcha. Let's, um, let's look forward a little bit, um, you know, towards kind of the future of uh, cryptocurrencies and blockchains. Um, Chris, I don't know if you, if you have thoughts. Where do you think, you know, we're going to go from, from this moment where we're at 200 billion, close to 200 billion in, in crypto asset market value? When I think of it in the context of what, what's happened in the overall IT industry, and we go back to the idea of voice and um, voice over IP, right? If you, if you go back to, say, the 80s, it was almost incomprehensible that voice would be a free service um, because you had to pay uh, for long distance calls. It was very cumbersome. And now you fast forward to today, and voice is transmitted uh, seamlessly and for free across the internet. And you, know, you can think of Bitcoin as money over IP and uh, marching towards this idea of seamless transfer of money over the internet. But more broadly, you know, this is um, just as the internet democratized the dissemination of information, this movement is democratizing the securitization of information and allowing the uh, very secure and costless transfer of all kinds of uh, securitized value around the world whether that be Ethereum and a crypto commodity and powering that decentralized world computer or Bitcoin or any of the thousand plus crypto assets out there. Yeah, so um, Web 1.0 uh, was the internet of information, uh, static text, images, hyperlinks. Web 2.0 added mobile, social, um, probably magnified the value in the ecosystem by some number of orders of magnitude. Web 3.0 is the web uh, or the internet of trusted transactions, the internet of automated agreements. Um, that's going to be another order or several orders of magnitude larger in terms of the value of that ecosystem. And Web 4.0 or 3.5 or something like that uh, is going to bring machines into the mix. Um, so the machine economy, where you bring IoT into the system where machines are transacting with one another. My intelligent agent is talking to, to Chris's intelligent agent using real money and real uh, enforceable or automatically enforceable agreements. So um, it's going to get big. David, do you have thoughts? Well, my view of uh, it's a bit different, uh, and it's that what we're seeing now is uh, the harbinger of a, a real desire, again, coming back to the public, uh, on the part of the public to somehow find a new way to democratize uh, the world, because there's a great deal of tension, I think, out there uh, in terms of income inequality, in terms of uh, the environment, uh, responsiveness of governance to social issues. I mean, we sometimes lose track of that in the tech streams, but uh, it's a, uh, I feel that tension, uh, you know, uh, to a great extent, and I think it's going to, uh, uh, something's going to, it's going to have to be resolved in one way or another in the next decade or so. And cryptography has the capability to resolve this in a very uh, peaceful and extraordinarily uh, beneficial manner. And um, that's, that's a vision that I'm working to build out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another way of thinking about uh, uh, 
um, the space we're in is that there's a qualitative change going on in the nature of money, basically. Um, we're moving from a world in which there are a, a lot of assets that are considered money, but uh, um, we're evolving to the point where we're going to tokenize everything. Um, uh, our money is currently somewhat frictional. Um, transactions in our current economy have delays built into them. When we tokenize things like, like kilowatt hours and money and I identity and access to events like this and um, maybe people start to uh, IPO themselves, uh, essentially <laughs> sell some tokens that represent uh, uh, claims on the revenue that they create. Um, we're moving into a world where uh, the clearing and settlement in every transaction involving these kinds of tokens can be shrunk into the instant of the transaction. So in that context, you get rid of the friction in the economy, you get rid of delays, and if you can compact value creation events much more closely to one another in time, you essentially um, have the value of, of compounding interest. So in your economy, uh, things are moving much more quickly and you can create a uh, very powerful growth engine. Sure. Well, one of, one of the issues is you know, using some of these decentralized applications or even sending a Bitcoin transaction today is not necessarily an easy thing to do. It's clunky, right? Um, what do you, very quickly, what do you guys think are the kind of the major obstacles that need to be removed if this is ever really going to hit the mainstream? You mentioned design, user experience. Um, I think we, we definitely need a lot more effort put into that. Uh, you, you could say that the crypto ecosystem is uh, user experience bankrupt right now, and, and that's just a matter of drawing more talent. And the markets are doing that, right? The markets draw in more talent. The other thing I would say is crypto networks are not companies. They don't have business models. They have incentive models. And so we need to go back to the drawing board of what are the right incentive models um, to power these networks, because typically we replicate the prior version before we create all the entirely new things and we're working towards all the entirely new things over the next couple decades. Yeah, so... so sorry, oh, well, I mean, I think that, you know, currencies and tokenization and all will, you know, become seamlessly integrated, just like, you know, into our clothing. I mean, it's something we're not going to be uh, cognizant of. That's... Uh, and it's, it's... That's not the whole world. Fabric, right? Fabric is one metaphor that, that people like to use. Um, we have a few seconds left. Um, David, lots of alumni of DigiCash now work in the cryptocurrency world. Do you think at one point Satoshi worked for you? <laughs> I think I had a lot to do with inspiring this whole uh, uh, movement, and I'm, I'm, you know, it's, it's gratifying now to see so many young people interested in uh, cryptography, and the whole world is starting to realize the power of this uh, technology, so it's it's uh, it's very exciting, and uh, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. Well, thank you to the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.